Kia ora everyone, welcome to the Women's Game. I'm Laura McGoldrick, thank you so much for joining us today. I am very spoiled again, as is the case every week, uh, with my panel tonight. I have the beautiful Ricky Swinnell and Honey Hitame Smiler. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Uh, Ricky, I'm gonna start with you. Where, where you been, girl? Uh, I well, see you on the breakdown, OPEC you a little bit, but then you're overseas somewhere else. You okay? Been waiting for the call up. Um, honey and I did say a couple of weeks ago, we're like, oh, have you been invited on the women's game? Like, mm, no, not yet. And then we thought, oh, maybe saving the best till sort of late in the season just to really bring it home strong. Yeah, that's, I, that's yeah. exactly what we've that's done what there. I'm glad you noticed yeah. that. I'm yeah. glad. Um, but actually, I, I think you need to check your emails. I think it might have been the <laughs> junk box because it's been a while since <laughs> I've seen you. You've been travelling so much. Honey, how are you? How's everything going with you? Yeah, really good, really good. Uh, it's been full on, actually. Yeah, it's like, I mean, it feels like it's been the, the start only weeks ago and now we're at the end of Opiki. So, uh, but it's been awesome. Uh, it's been too short, if, uh, if I'm honest with it, but... Uh, yeah, no, it's been full on. Right, let's check out some of the highlights from Opiki's first semi-final, the Blues taking on Matatu. Here's Kelly, and now Brooker Flat running a great hole and a great ball as the energizer Kendra Reynolds under the post for Matatu. So a quick shift along for Vahakolo, keeping the ball alive, the Blues, and Caitlin Vahakolo goes in at the corner. Ponsonby shovels it along, Robbins Ritty one on one, the foot once more, McKelly to a lovely little shift out the back. Maliapo to the line. Maliapo powering through. Maliapo over. Baylor looks for a runner. Picks out McKelly to just the player you want to pick out there. Close to the line. They keep plugging out to the right. Robbins ready this time around the corner. She does get her hat trick. And Matatu take the lead again. There's under five minutes to play now. And Matatu got really well in their drive here and it's really difficult for Baylor to get it out there. See all Heidi Fox has got herself and all over that the veteran and she's given the Blues what for as well. Delamere takes one more, Corbett takes it away. They didn't win a game last year and now Matatu will play for the title. They go through to the final of Super Rugby Opiki. You could certainly see how much it meant to Matatu to get that win. Honey, what did you make of the game as a whole, though? Because the Blues, they play good rugby. Oh, they did play good rugby. I think, for me, it's the brand of rugby that they want to play. And, you know, they've got, they've got the likes of Carlos Spencer in there, and he talked about them wanting to play up-tempo, running Matatu off their feet, which we know Matatu is probably the fittest team in this competition. So for them to take confidence and think, no, nah, actually, we're going to run them off their feet and play, like, real live rugby, and they, they very rarely use their kicking game. They just wanted to run at everything, you know. And what I liked about it too is just the physicality that they bought and, and consistently throughout that. I, I just thought for, for me personally there was just some really key moments because it was it was tip for tat, it was mm. try for try. Key moments, Lucy Jenkins was vital, Steph Till Heidi Fox was vital, but also for the Blues, Sylvia Brunch, she was impressive as well. Like she just she just does not give in for a barely just turned 19 year old kid. Her skill set is unreal. You'd think she's been playing this game for 20 years. Do you think Mother 2 had the confidence because they knew they could beat the Blues having done it in that first round and being a short tournament, everyone remembers everything so... Everyone remembers everything because it's only a few weeks, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, yes and no. I think that they were driving off motivation because they had such a good dig at the Chiefs' money the week before. They took motivation from that and then implemented, I think, what they lacked from last week. They pulled it up. They pulled it, I suppose, what you could say, almost a complete performance up against the Blues. For me, it's the different styles of play that they're playing. They're very much a structured team, but the balance when they can transition into unstructured play was, was quite evident and vice versa with the Blues, whereas they are probably a more prolific unstructured team, um, but then when it did come to that structured play, whether they were nailing sort of, I suppose, their kicking game, uh, trying to get their team in the right areas of the park, and then it just fell away in terms of their set piece. From everyone I've spoken to has thoroughly enjoyed uh, Opiki so far, so let's have a look at semi-final number two. Ohepa. Ohepa with a bit of footwork. First try, Chiefs Manawa from the front row. Gets it within the two. That's a try for Takura Nata to point out to the left-hand side. Ball passed and the tackle nice offload. And Tanika Willison, second try. Fitzgerald and Connor in complete charge. They advance and half a metre out. Now they're in the end goal. And try number three. Big chance here for the Hurricanes. They go to the left edge. A cut-out ball. And 
Olsen Baker. This young, precocious talent with an enormous future. To the open side, Mahino Tauhinu. Now Chuba trying to return favour for Paul. Trying to do what the Hurricane did. She turns the ball on the inside. A shift and a little bit of confusion amongst the Chiefs. Manawa, so they have to go back to go forward. And now Paul should be too quick down the right edge. Mirangi Paul, a terrific athlete. 43 21. Chiefs Manawa over Hurricanes Poa. I mean, the Chiefs are so good, and they have been so good throughout both competitions now. Uh, Ricky, what is Mata Two gonna do to beat them? Like, can they? Are we? Because so I don't want to. I mean, obviously that's my team. I was gonna say you're just gonna let her fly on the Chiefs. Now look, I think the Chiefs. I'm too scared yeah. because I, I I want Mata Two to win. <laughs> no, look. Well, look, Mata Two. Um, the week before, they they gave them a go. The score blew out at times, but Mata Two started really well and they finished that match really well. There was just a bad patch in the middle where the Chiefs were allowed to get rolling. And the the biggest issue for Mata Two is is sorting out, is stopping the Chiefs set piece because that's where they're dominating. And isn't it funny, like, when we look back at, say, the World Cup and we're like, oh, England and they're rolling more in their set-piece play and, oh, it's boring and whatever. <laughs> it's effective because the Chiefs do it as well. But the Chiefs have also got that ability out, out wide. So, yeah, for Mata 2, their, their, their front, or their, their scrum in particular, got absolutely towed up by the Chiefs the week before. So that'll be a big one for that Black Ferns front row in particular to really front for, for Mata 2. But the Chiefs, I think, are just setting a new standard, a different standard, and maybe one that some of the other teams, particularly probably the Hurricanes, could aspire to in terms of that professional ethos that they are setting, which is still, I think, an area where these clubs and these women are learning in some parts because they're not all professional. Some of them are, but the vast majority of the players in this competition are not full-time professional athletes. And so those are the uh, a team like the Chiefs. They've got players who are setting those standards all the time, and, and that's probably where they go. And now you can just talk about how good. Oh, 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 off you go, honey. I was <laughs> going to get Ricky get a word in. Now you yeah, go, yeah, girl. Yeah. Take off your I'll jacket. Really let loose. Oh look, you know, for me, we've seen this year. I suppose there was a target on the Chiefs' backs, right? They're undefeated, they haven't, been, they haven't been beaten at all throughout. But for me, it was like all the teams got their hopes up because you saw the exodus of all the sevens players, they went back to sevens. And then we've got all these names, Merirangi Paul, for instance, Kate Henwood, all of these new players come in who nobody knew of, and now they've raised the bar for the Chiefs. And their foundation is awesome. Like, no one's getting close to their set piece at the moment. But they're not resting on their laurels in terms of that. They're adding variation. You've got Hazel Tubert kicking, um, you know, immensely. You can't stop her. Tanika Willison comes out of nowhere, traditionally a sevens player. She's played a fair amount of 15s, but to play it at this level, she's unreal. No one can get their hands on her. And I just love what she's doing. And the player for me, what Nix is doing so well is she's doing her core cool role, but she's also making everybody else around her look really good too. So they've just got so much depth across their board. Player for player, really hard to match. But if Mata 2 pulled together a collective performance and I suppose got that transition between their backs and forwards, you know, really cemented, I, I feel like they're relying too much on their game drivers and, and maybe Renee out at the back. But if they actually can, I suppose, share a lot of that workload, I, they'll have a good dig at the Chiefs. To your point earlier, you said a lot defensively it's been difficult for teams to sort of build things up there and, and sort of get things set and ready to go. So what? how do we fix that? If it's going to be the shorter tournament the whole time, how are we to fix that, honey? Well, it's time in the saddle, really. Like, you know, you, you make a really good point in terms of their defensive structures because most teams, because of the short preparation time, they're focused on attack and that's why we're seeing so much running rugby. But again, that means that the, the defensive patterns and the systems are falling apart, so we're seeing high-scoring tries. But... You know, to, to be honest, when you're playing in such a short competition, last year it was more a tournament than a competition, that, you know, you don't have the time to really work on that. If we're doubling the weeks or, we're, you know, we're adding the Super W next year, then that's when I think defence, you know, people talk about defence will win games, but at the moment, attack is winning people games because there's no time to work on defence. Yeah, exactly right, and I think you have to flip it. Well, if you're not paying them enough, they can't spend the entire week. They can't train twice a day. They can't tra train every single day and, and be like that. So it's that kind of, it's a bit chicken and egg at the moment. And if the competition, or hopefully, surely the competition extends out next year to either be a double round robin or we we make it with Australia and, and whatever, then they're going to have to dip into the, the money pot to be able to play these women so that they 
can be training all the time and then the quality again is going to go up another level. And I mean, we don't, we don't want to see like defences dominating too much game because we like the attacking rugby. But, oh, like a 50-50 Yeah, yeah, you know, but to be able to put that time and effort into another key element of the game yeah. um, will be, you know, is, is vital for the, for the squads going forward. Look, I suppose in saying that, although like the complete structure's not there, the yeah. physicality's yeah, there, totally. right? So that's where you rely on the heart and the courage and, and just the, the straight out mongrel. And that's what you're seeing. Like there's some massive clashes going on and, and you mentioned the likes of Liana Michele too, Tanya Kalunavali, she's come out of nowhere and just bashing people around, flicking them off like flies. You know, and, and that's been awesome to see Crystal Murray from the Hurricanes Pro. I mean, they are a physical mm. dominant team and that's probably what's kept them in the competition is probably their defensive. You know, you've got Rachel Rakato and the likes of Rihanna Ferris who are probably the unsung heroes who are doing so much work in and around that. Lucy Jenkins I already mentioned, but there is, there's a ton of uh, defensive talent in there, but it's all a one-off effort, I think. I think you forgot the love of the game as well, because that does seem to be a lot of the reason that these fabulous young athletes are doing what they're doing, and so well. So the final is happening this weekend. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, NRLW we're talking about. We'll see you soon. Welcome back to the women's game. Joining us in studio, we've obviously got Honey Hidame Smiler, Ricky Swinnell, and the gorgeous Crystal Rota, who I see every weekend now. We get mm -hmm. together a lot and just watch the Warriors, actually, at the moment. Um, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. One of the first shows we did, actually, uh, of the women's game, there was a lot of talk about how the NRLW was nicking players from New Zealand, and that's a real concern for us. And I'd love to get your thoughts on it, because you've been over there and played in it. What's it like? What's the tournament like? Yeah, the tournament's amazing itself, and um, I guess people are sort of running away and playing over there because that those are the best opportunities that are being presented for them. So, um, I mean, relocation is always going to be hard, and it doesn't matter who's relocating. But you know, as a mother myself, it was extremely hard leaving my babies behind um, for the three-month duration. But I mean. Personally, I think it's whatever opportunity works for the player, what suits their family, what suits their lifestyle. Um, and, you know, there's always going to be chat around loyalty to whether you start in league and then you're taking off to rugby or vice versa, and that's going to be a chat all the time. But I just think whatever works for the player. Honey, I'd love your take on that and that competition and the fact that we are in danger of losing players because they're better paid, uh, for, for, for starters. Um, but in terms of the competition and that change from rugby to league, what do, you, what do you think about it? Yeah, look, I think it's not just our rugby players that we need to lose to rugby league, which we are at the moment, but it's also our, our home-based rugby league girls yeah. are all going. You're going to see a big exodus in terms of our Kiwi Ferns recent squad have just come off the World Cup. A whole lot of them are going to go re-sign and go over to the NRW because the pathway here at the moment is, is a little bit up in the air and, and until the Warriors are able to come forward, I mean, they're going to look at a team in 2025 and then there's that'll sort of, I suppose, cement and keep our talent here. But at the moment, the only option is for them to go to the NRLW. But I'll tell you what, the level of the NRLW is just something, you know, like we're sort of seeing, I suppose, the infancy of rug, uh, Super Rugby Opiki here and, and how that's really coming about. But like you're getting 10,000, 15,000 people showing up to NRLW games over in Australia and the, obviously then there's the professional side of it, the, the payments are a lot better and it's just it's, it's such an entertaining brand of football that they're playing it's fast it's athletic it's everything the physicality is there crystal and like you know when you think that they debuted this NRLW what 2017 mm -hmm. I was over with St George Dragons and I, I feel like they just they went about it the right way they started small they expanded expanded and they just keep expanding and they're doing it at the right time because everybody right now for women over in Australia their first choice is to play rugby league and over here it's probably maybe a second third choice um, but when they go to Australia it's, it's completely different because the competition is there and the competition is is massive. But the good thing in Australia is that their pathways is, is phenomenal and, you know, they've got Tasha Girl Cup and they're starting all the grades um, in a professional space from the young age and building them up. So, um, you know, it's it's developing the talent that's needed to have these 10 teams. So I think it's, a, it's in a good place in Australia at the moment. Um, just hopefully uh, we can get the Warriors on board, yeah. so, you know, sooner rather than later. A little bit reminds me of when the Sevens came out, right? You know, we had the go for gold and then everyone was jumping ship. You know, we had Portion and more come over from netball uh, Kayla McAllister, you know, myself, I come from league straight away. Everyone wanted a piece of it. And that, that's a little bit what's now happening with the NRLW, mm. is that everyone's going to jump ship. You're going to get players from other sports going, look, this is a this is a cool game, because it is. I mean, it really is. <laughs> 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 not biased. Not biased here. Not biased at all. No? But, yeah. um, but anyway... You know, and that's what we're seeing is, is players are going to come from other sports. We've already seen it. Nile Williams, you know, look at her. She's going to jump over and have a crack. And Gail Broughton's already jumped over from the sevens. And, and it's 
you know, I get a lot of players asking me, specifically rugby players, you know, hey, look, I've been hit up, should I go and play rugby league? I'm like, mate, play what makes you happy. Mm. And I know rugby league makes me super happy if I was to compare to maybe 15s. Look at her face light up every, every day, says every that. day, day of the week. Well, we've been around a while, Laura, like <laughs> yes. you and I. And, and, not long. Not long, no, but like we're 21. Around, we just celebrated our 21st and birthday. sport and all of that for a long time, like watching the, like these women play. Never in a million years would we have thought we would be having these conversations no. about, oh, players jumping ship and being poached and big contracts and we're sitting on a couch for women having a yarn about it. Like, how good? We're here now and then we've also got, you know, the Warriors who have committed to 2025. Is that leaving it a bit late, though? Because you said not to run before we walk. There's not a bottomless money pit. And for a club like the Warriors, and these guys are no better than I would, who have had three years away from home, they are having to rebuild in some ways. And so, you, you know, you do, to me, you, you don't want to do this stuff half assed um, if you're going to commit, you have to commit to do it properly, and maybe that is having a proper plan in place. But, I mean, I'm sure you, we would all like to see it happen sooner than that. Yeah, I definitely would like to see yeah. it yeah. happen sooner than that. And, and reason being is that, um, you know, we've got so much talent here that um, the, the girls that get to re relocate and go and play in Australia, that's fine, but there are a lot of girls here that can't do that. Yeah. And then those players, you know, they get missed the opportunity and the, the, the development in that time period of these these couple of years waiting on the Warriors, you know, it's, it's a big difference. And then they when, when the Warriors do come around, the, the Australian team is, yeah, again, 10 steps ahead of us. So it just, it's, I, I think it needs to be done sooner, but I understand that side of things too. There's always the, the money side of things and the business side of things that, you know, a lot of people don't understand as well. Well, we've probably already seen it in terms of, you know, earlier in the year we had the NRL uh, All-Stars game and a lot of the, the women's team, the, the Māori side, was picked from Australian-based players. You know, and that's tough because we have our first NRL All-Stars game here in New Zealand, in Aotearoa, and 80% of the team was picked from Australian-based yeah. players. You know, so, so again, we, we've, I suppose, missed the boat there in terms of those pathways. And so it's, it's vital that, you know, we look at our championship and premiership in the women's competition at the moment, you know, club... Club Rugby League here, it'll start in April. They'll go through club, then they'll play for their provinces, zones, however that might shape out. And then um, and, and then they'll go into either championship and premiership. And then, obviously, then there's a pathway for the Kiwi Ferns. I know that there's in place to get the, the Kiwi Ferns some more test matches. And then, but again, like, to really get that depth and that talent coming through and the experience that you need to be playing at the moment, Australia leading the way to be able to match them in terms of, you know, being at the, the best in the world the NRLW at right now is really setting that standard. They certainly are, right? We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to continue this conversation. Plus, we're going to find out just what Ricky Swinnell puts in her suitcase when she goes on all those seven trips. Welcome back to the women's game. I wish you were in studio with us right now so you could see everyone sit up, right? Once they hear that music going, it's a very exciting time. I have a gorgeous panel of women with me. Ricky Swinell is fixing a microphone. Well done, you, Crystal Rota, and Honey Hitame Smiler. Ladies, I'd love to know in league, we, we've had uh, some rugby players on the show talking about having babies and what that's like and how hard it is, and you've got to get real buy in from you know the governing bodies actually to help because the reality is women want to have children. Um, not all of them, but some do, and some have them, and we've seen them at Opiki on the sidelines. We've got mothers of twins. And I'm thinking, what's happening here? <laughs> I could barely tie my shoes at that stage, but that's cool. Um, so what has that been like for you? Has there been help? Is there things in place to help in, in rugby league in New Zealand for women who want to be mothers and play at the same time? Yeah, um, interesting, in, interestingly enough, they have um, just recently, when we went to the World Cup, they allowed for a couple of the um, mums to bring their babies with them. Um, so that was a first for the Kiwi Ferns in, in our space. And um, I could just tell how much of a world of a difference it made for the two mums in regards to their performance. Um, both of the, the women that brought their babies, um, Shanice Parker and Uppy Nichols, um, you know, they had outstanding tournaments and I put it down to the fact that, you know, they had their babies with them, they were content, there was no worry, you know, no anxiety about leaving their babies behind and um, that was that was a good introduction to, um, to the Kiwi Fern space and something that, you know, I I hope continues to go forward because it's so important and um, it's something that's needed to be done, you know, a long time ago. But, um, you know, Hunt can probably talk more about it being a Board of Trustees members and I know that she's probably um, pushed for something like that in that space. But, you know, having someone like Hunt on the board that can um, speak on behalf of us females, knowing what it's like to be a mum and a professional athlete, I, I think has really helped our game. 
Oh, look, it, it has to happen, right? You know, if you, if you want to really progress the women's game, we, we come as a package. If, as mums, we always come as a package. And so in order to ensure that our, our sports are looking after us, they've got, to, they've got to put systems and processes in place to ensure that we can come as our whole selves. And that includes babies in tow, children in tow, partners, families, villages in tow as well. So I, I think it's a great move. And you're seeing so much more different sports really put those processes in place as they, as they work towards that either, you know, professional or semi-professional space. We often talk about what happens on the field, but off the field too, there are women behind the microphones, behind the cameras, totally dominating, and that's you. So how are you doing, and what's it been like? I'm good. I mean, like... All right, we'll never mind. Yeah, yeah, that'll, that'll do. do. The show's done. Nice to be here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. No, look, look I, I think I was really lucky, and when I was about 15 or 16, I knew that I wanted to be a sports journalist, and I wanted to work in sport. I didn't necessarily want to be a commentator or whatever. I just knew that sports journalism and broadcasting was the thing that I wanted to do and there was no and I didn't see any reason why I couldn't even though there weren't very many other women doing it so I was just kind of went for it and um, I guess look I'm not someone who's a massive goal setter or I want to do this or tick off that or have that show or do that and so things have just progressed and, and I guess I mean I work hard at it um, I do spend a lot of time away from my friends and family I don't have kids or anything like that but I you know you you miss out on things and um, but at the same time I get the best seat in the house to occasions like the Black Ferns winning a Rugby World Cup at home in front of 40,000 people at Eden Park and then getting overwhelmed by people sending me messages and I burst into tears, you know, I'm like, I didn't really, I just talked about it, I didn't want to do way more, but you know, helping like, become part yeah. of that theatre, what you yeah. do, there's and, a real art to it. But this is the thing, like, I get to be, so for someone who's always loved sport, I get to tell people about it and that... You know, you have your long days, but my worst day at work is better than people's most days. But you know, best, be, uh, worst. Sorry, my worst day at work is better than did most people's best days. Did you talk for a living? Days. Did I you? I talk for a job. <laughs> so every player and every person, and every team has a story. So I kind of think, you know. What, how can I tell their story and how can I make them better? And I, honestly, I sometimes think I know more about the players than they do about their own lives. <laughs> it's actually a little bit creepy. If you looked at my Instagram search history, it's a little bit creepy. Of, you can delete uh, Yeah, yeah, of, <laughs> of what I look at. See. Like, oh, yeah, and you find out so much about people. And, and I love, you know, like, and I sort of started in sports journalism and when we weren't doing a lot of women's sport and I was someone who could have and should have done more 10 years ago. I was never going to be a player, but I found a career in sport because I still love sport and there's so many opportunities for sporty girls who aren't going to be black ferns, they aren't going to be silver ferns, they aren't going to be kiwi ferns like me to stay in sport and really add something that way. And so I hope, yeah, people find that way kind of... Uh, Crystal, for you, you, you're starting to get into the media side of it now. You're joining me with the Warriors on the weekends. How are you enjoying that? And it's, it's not a transition because you're still playing, but... What has that journey been like? I mean, you see people like Ricky, she makes it look so easy, but how have you found it? Oh, I'm loving it now. To be fair, when I first did it, I, um, we, I, we was our opening Warriors, when I, our first season of Warriors, and I went on as, as a guest after our um, warm-up game. And then the next week they said, oh, hey, would you like to come back and do the next week? And I said, oh, hell no. That was so scary. I was so nervous. <laughs> I was sitting there, I was like shaking behind the table. I was like, no, nah, man, that's not for me. And it's like, oh, you know, come and give it a go. So I went back and did it. And I think, like, that was 2018, I think, and I had did it several times. And like, the nerves still were just, you know, insane, crazy insane. Saying live TV, didn't want to make a mistake, didn't want to say anything dumb or stupid. My first game I did, I said, um, the back five are eating up them balls. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, oh my gosh, I said, they're never going to want me back. I was like... Actually, that's exactly why you came back, I heard. <laughs> Don't worry, I've got so... a list of things like that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, now I'm enjoying it and loving it. And honestly, the, the biggest mentor for me has been Huns, which is, you know, she's been amazing for me. I've come in a couple of times just to watch her and she, you know, she's given me tips and helps me out. She's picked me up for mahi and just calms the nerves a bit when we did All-Stars. So she's been a massive um, mentor and influence for me. Um, and it's, it's quite fitting, really, because I've played footy with her for so long in my life and we're sort of heading in the same career post-footy. Um, and I enjoy working with friends, so that makes it even better. So, no, I'm actually loving it, to answer your question. H honey, you, you are doing a great job. The transition has been seamless and you are so good in both the league space and the rugby. I, I love working with you because it's easy and you're fun and you have such a wealth of knowledge. How do you find it though? Are there nerves for you there different to when you were playing the games? 
Oh, look, I, I love it. I think it's, it's a very privileged position to be in. And, and, you know, when you get towards the end of your career and you're sort of wondering, oh, man, you, you, you miss that, I suppose, team environment. But then now, being behind a microphone and being in commentary or media or whatever, you get the best seats in the house. You still get to be involved in those team environments. But also, it's a responsibility. It's a responsibility and it's a way for me, I think, that you can give back to the games that you love. You can give back to rugby and, and rugby league and specifically the women's game, which is always my favourite to be involved in. Because because it's a way that you can promote it, it's a way you can promote the players, and when you've, I suppose, got that inside information and knowledge around these players, it, it means more to you, and you, you've been in that seat as well, so I, I absolutely have been loving it. Um, it's full on. I don't know how, you, you know, some, how you guys can transfer from, like, completely different sports, like, rugby and league is kind of similar, in a sense, but to jump from, like, netball and cricket, they're just totally blow my mind, but, uh, you know, it's just, uh, the hardest part is put makeup on. For me. <laughs> Not a makeup person, um, but yeah, like I, I've really enjoyed it, and, and like I said, you know, you know, it's being able to bring people through because you're seeing that so many uh, women actually now that because they're seeing us, right? So they're seeing us on TV. They're like, I actually want to do that. That looks like a really cool job, um, and I and I love that. Laura, well, I think for so long, you know, a lot of women in sports media, we were pitted against each other. Yeah. I remember starting doing some cricket and someone said to me, are you the new Laura? And I was like, well, no, I'm doing, A, I'm doing commentary or a different job. And there can be more than one of us, you know, yes. and, and it was always like this competitive or competitive thing. And from outsiders' view, the reality is we all go and have a wine together. You know, like the, there's a couple of girls who work at TVNZ and, and different outlets and we, we catch up and we help each other out. Yeah. And like these two are just saying, you know, have helped each other out to get there. And so it's it's becoming this kind of cohort that the guys have always had. Yeah. And that now well, there's more of us. And, it, and it's cool. And, and it isn't a competition between so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. We can all be there. We can all create our own space mm -hmm. in this media landscape, which is amazing. And it's been nice. I, I've certainly noticed a shift in the last few while. There's, it's not just, you know, not that we're not competing, we're actually championing each yes. other now, yeah. which I love being a part of. It feels like it's... It should be this way, and there are a lot of us who are very good at, you know, what they do, and I'm so lucky that I get to talk to you, and I want to thank you guys so much for your time today. You are fabulous, and you are talented and brilliant, and it's been a privilege to chat to you today. Ricky, Crystal, Honey, have a fabulous rest of the day. You guys, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next week on The Women's Game.